Oh, these look delicious. Cinnamon. Woo wee. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's legal now. to the phrase, what happens at the mall stays at the mall. I mean, that stuff's supposed to be private, but it's fun going shopping, especially when we're going shopping for you. And so if you're here for the first time today, I want to welcome you to our series, our 2018 uh, Christmas series. It's called Presence. And uh, Scott and I, since we're co-lead pastors this year, we decided we'd preach this series together. And he would bring the first message in the series as his first present to you as as co-lead pastor, and I would bring three. And the reason I got the three is because we weren't sure how many, which Sunday he was going to be here or not. So it turned out to be a good plan because he's not here today. But you know, it's kind of unbelievable that this will be my last Christmas series to you because I preached the very first Christmas series to you uh, in December of 2004. And, and you think about that. What has happened since 2004 in your life. Where, where were you in 2004? Were you even living in Ottawa? Were you even attending the bridge? Had you come to the point in your spiritual life where you had invited Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior? Were you still in school? Were you single? Did you have any kids? Are you working in the same job you were back then? You know, what all happened in, in those years? Back, back in December of 2004, I was 51. 51, hard to believe. And back then at 51, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that, uh, you know, all of my girls were still at home. It was a good days. They were all still living at home, you know, and my dad was still alive and well, and the Leafs were still losing. And nothing, some things haven't changed too much, you know. But one thing has changed. Back then in 2004, you could buy a liter of gas for, for 77 cents. Not pretty good, eh? 77 cents, you could get a liter of gas. And you know how much you could buy a detached house for in 2004 in Ottawa? You could buy it for $235,000 versus 447 today, the average price of a detached house. Can you believe that? But when I preached my first Christmas message in 1974, you could buy a liter of gas for 10 cents. If you buy it in the morning, it's 11 cents. You know, it's always more expensive in the morning. But 10 cents for a liter of gas. Can you believe that? And you know how much a detached house was in Ottawa in 1974? $46,000, $46, which means you could have bought 10 houses back then in Ottawa, 10 detached houses for what you could buy one detached house today. Unbelievable, eh? So much has changed, and yet I still feel like I'm 51. But, you know, it doesn't matter what you feel like or what it seems. The truth of the matter is the years have gone by, and this is my last Christmas series to speak as your pastor. And so I had to come up with three really good presents. And so the last three, you just couldn't pick any ordinary present. We had our small group Christmas party on Friday night, and we had a lot of fun, a lot of laughs. And one person got reindeer slippers for Christmas at that party. Now, I couldn't give you reindeer slippers, as cute as they are, and as much fun as they are. That, that's not good enough for a last three gifts and so I've tried to get something that would last and something significant. So last week I gave you the first one, and if you were here, you remember, it was a gift card that entitles you to freedom from expectations. That Jesus said that he came to set the oppressed free. And there are few things more oppressive in life than the weight of the expectations of other people on us. And Jesus came to set us free from them. I hope you use that card this week. Now, this morning, I want to give you this second gift. 
And it is far greater than this one, and it's far more expensive than this one. But, but again, you know, I am actually re-gifting you a gift that Jesus gave to us on that first Christmas, and I'm re-gifting it because there are so many who have never really opened it, or if they've opened it, they've never really used it. And once again, it's not a gift that you can buy on Amazon.ca or that you can really put in a, a box. And so I've had to put a symbolic gift inside the box to give to you this year so that it would represent what I'm trying to, to share with you. And so this week, the symbolic gift that I have for you is smaller than last week. It's a key. It's just a key. Because you see, a key represents ownership. You've got the key in your pocket probably or your purse right now to the car out in the parking lot that you own. You've got a key in your pocket to your home that you own. You may have a key to a, a boat or a shed or a cottage. Whatever we own, we have the keys to it. And so today I want to give you the keys to something that you actually own far greater than any of the things I've mentioned. This key gives you ownership to Christmas, to Jesus, to faith, and to the bridge. Now, you may not have realized that you own Christmas, but you really do. Not just you, but you own a part of it. Because you are definitely part of the group that God gave the first and greatest Christmas gift to. And that first and greatest gift was Jesus. He didn't give it just to you, but certainly you are included in that first gift. And so I know that God gave that gift and gives you ownership to all of these things because of what the angels said to the shepherds on the hillside on that first Christmas. You know, we read this story every year and we read the message of the angels many times. And yet I think sometimes we miss the real significance of what's in that story. There's one sentence in particular that is important. So I want to read it to you again. Luke recorded it. Luke was a historian who was a contemporary of Jesus and the disciples. He was a doctor. And he recorded the events of Jesus' life by going and talking to eyewitnesses. I wouldn't be at all surprised that he talked to the shepherds and asked them what happened that night out on the hillside. And the shepherds told them that an angel showed up. And then they said this. The angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Now the key phrase in there, if you ask me, is this one here. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to, to you. To you. Of course, the billion-dollar question is, who's the you? Now, some might argue that it was the shepherds because that's who he was, they were speaking to. And I, I know you could make that argument, but I think it would be wrong. And the reason I think it would be wrong is that the shepherds were not the only one invited to the manger. Because remember, there were other wise men who were also invited, and maybe even first, because up to two years before the birth of Jesus, the wise men had set out following the star and came to Bethlehem and worshiped Jesus. And then, of course, there were Mary and Joseph. They owned the baby Jesus. So there are more than just the shepherds who owned him. And then, of course, we read that eight days after the birth of Jesus, they took Jesus to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord. And it says the Holy Spirit led the, the priest Simeon back to the church so that he could see the Savior. And so it's very clear that this you is not a specific individual you. It was more than one. And even John, the best friend of Jesus, backs that up. John recorded much of what Jesus said and taught and did. And one of the things he recorded Jesus saying is the most well-known verse in Scripture. He recorded Jesus saying this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him would have everlasting life. And there's two key words in here that is really important to us this Christmas, and it's the word world. God gave Jesus to the world that whoever believes in him. And so Jesus wasn't given just to the shepherds. He was given to the world. He was given to all of us. And so there can be no doubt, there can be no argument that the you that the shepherds were talking about was the collective you. It's you and you and you and you and, and, and me. It's all of us together. I know it's a little corny. In fact, it's a lot corny, but it could be said that this babe's for you. It really could because he was born for you. You see, when a gift is given to you and you accept it, the ownership transfers from the person giving it to you. You own it. And on that first Christmas, God the Father gave his son to you. And so it can truthfully be said that you own him. You own him. 
In fact, if you're a follower of Jesus today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the truth is you're not just a believer, you're an owner. You're an owner of Jesus, of the gospel, of the kingdom, of heaven. You own it all. I don't know how many of you remember some of the ads that were on TV back in the 80s, but I was younger back then, and I, I remember a lot of them. And one of them in particular, I remember, what was by a uh, hair club uh, owner. He owned this hair club that basically, I believe it was a hair transfer, a transplant rather, that if you're bald, they would transplant hair and, and give you a full head of hair. And the, the guy, the owner of the company would come out. He was the only one in the ad and he came out and he's got a full head of hair and he, he gives a spiel about, you know, my product is good and it really works and you ought to buy it. And he ends the commercial by holding up a picture of himself when he was bald. And he says, in closing, I'm not, you see, I'm not only the owner I'm a client. Well, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can say the same thing in reverse. We can say, I'm not just a client. I'm not just a believer. I am an owner, an owner of Jesus, of the Christian faith, and of his church. And Jesus himself and the teaching of the apostles backs that up. In fact, Paul the apostle who was, uh, as we said, he was one of the, the leaders in the church. In fact, he was the head of the Jesus movement, a highly educated man, and he wrote half of the New Testament. He, he wrote to the Christians living in the city of Galatia, and this is what he wrote to them. He said, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us into himself through Jesus Christ. God decided in advance before the creation of the world to adopt us. Not just to love us, not just to, you know, to, to work with us, but he chose to adopt us, to bring us right into his fa family. He, he didn't come so that we could simply be a consumer of spiritual things. He came that we would be an owner of spiritual things. In, in fact, he goes on in, in his letter to Romans, because he talks on the same topic again and again, and, and, and described it to the Romans in this way. He said, now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Do you realize that? You are, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a co-heir with Jesus of all of the things of God, the kingdom of God. We own it together. God didn't come. Jesus didn't come on that first Christmas so that we could do his work for him. He came to bring us into the family so that we would be part of the family business, that, that we would be part of those who helped to build bridges between people far from Jesus and Jesus Christ. In, in fact, I love the way he described it when he wrote to the Corinthians because he keeps teaching this again and again because he wants us to understand this point. And when he wrote to the Corinthians, he said this, he said, he, God the Father, will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. This is a huge verse in itself. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Because look what it says here. God will keep you strong. God keep you strong. How long? To the end. So that when we come before God the Father on Judgment Day, we will be without blame. If you're feeling discouraged, if you're feeling down this morning, this is an unbelievable verse for you. If you're feeling kind of weak and you don't have what it takes to serve Christ, just remember what Paul said here, God will keep you strong. But it's the second part of this, the second verse that I want to emphasize here. He says, God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ. That's unbelievable. He's invited us to be partners with Jesus of all that God has. He's not invited us to be an employee or a mercenary, somebody who fights for him and does his work. He's invited us to be a partner, a full partner with Jesus Christ in the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. Can you imagine how you would feel and what you would think if tomorrow morning... The, cost, the owner of the Costco where you show, shop called you up and said, hey, I've seen you in my store several times. Now I want to offer you partnership with me in the ownership of this store. You don't have to buy in. It's already been covered. You don't have to work in the store for a while until you work yourself up. I'm just giving you flat out partnership with me in the ownership of this store. Do you want it? Well, I imagine after you picked yourself up off the floor, you would say yes. Who, I mean, who wouldn't say yes to owning a, a Costco store? I mean, that's unbelievable. But the truth of the matter is, God the Father is offering you and me this morning, this Christmas, something far greater than a partnership in the ownership of a Costco. He is offering us partnership in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God. 
It, it, that's unbelievable. You, you, we don't have to pay to, to get it. The price has already been paid for by Jesus Christ. We, we don't have to earn our way to get it because we can't. It's simply a gift from God through his son, Jesus Christ. We become partners with Jesus of all that he has. And this is the re-gift that I'm offering you this morning. I'm offering you the key to the kingdom, the key to ownership of all that God has and all that God does and of God's church. It's an unbelievable offer. But in all transparency, I've got to tell you this morning that there is an upside and there's a downside to ownership. No matter what you're owning, there's an upside and there is a downside. So let's get rid of the downside real quick. The downside of ownership is responsibility. I'm telling you, when you own something, you inherit a huge amount of responsibility. There's a big difference from simply being a consumer to being an owner. They're not the same. Ownership is something you are. Consumer is something you do. Ownership is something you are. Consumer is what you do. Owners build up. Consumers use. Owners protect the brand. They'll never say or do anything that will reflect badly on the brand because they own it. And owners are fully invested. Their time, their talent, their money. In fact, owners are willing to make sacrifices. If somebody's missing, an owner will step in and fill the gap. If, if they're short of a little bit of money, the owners will step in and give their own money to make sure that the, the, what they own is secure. C consumers don't do those things because they're consumers. When, when I go to Costco tomorrow, more, uh, tomorrow at noon with Remy for our weekly lunch there, you know, and if, if I get there and the, the person you know that checks you your little card there and uh, to make sure you, you can get in. If that person says to me, hey, you know, we're a little short staffed today. You know, we check everybody before you leave. Will you just go over there and check everybody out when they leave this morning? You can take Remy with you, but just, just go and stand there and check them out. Well, of course I'm not going to do that. I'm going to look, are you crazy? I don't work here. I'm a consumer. I'm not going to do that. And if I heard that the Costco was ten, lost $10,000 last week, when I, when I go and pay for our food, I'm not going to slip the cashier an extra hundred bucks and say, hey, this is for to help with a deficit. <laughs> you, don't, you don't do that as a consumer, do you? But an owner would do those things because it's theirs. And, and an owner's, they aren't nine to five people. Those of you who are owners of businesses in this room know that for a fact. Owners tend to give more and work more and work longer than anybody else. Why? Because it's not a job for them. They own it. It's what they are. And so there are all of these things that come with being an owner. And so there are, it's a downside. There's a huge amount of responsibility that comes with ownership. But the truth is, though there's a legitimate downside to being an owner, the upside is so much greater than the downside. It's not even worth comparing. It's such a huge difference. Because you see, the truth is, owners get more. You just get more out of owning than you do uh, simply, you know, uh, going to the store. It, it, it's true. It's more. You know, if somebody, if somebody asked me this morning or, or offered me this morning, you can either be a customer over there at Costco or you can own it. I'm telling you, I'm picking owner in a heartbeat. Why? Because owners get so much more. You see, I, I really think, <laughs> this is my opinion, but I think owning a Costco is a license to print money. I, I mean, have you seen those stores? I mean, it doesn't matter which one you go to. The parking lot's always full. And if you watch those buggies coming out, I mean, they're all filled up. They call it the $300 store, dollar store because you go to spend 20 bucks and come out with $300 worth of stuff. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I did some research this week and they, they said that, the, that a good Costco store, a good Costco store on a good day, not a good week, not a good month, but a good day can, uh, can sell a million dollars worth of product. A million dollars, one day. And guess what? If you're an owner, you share in the profits. You know, they must love that because they're sharing in the profits. That million dollars or some of that's going right into their pocket because they're an owner. And there's also the owners get to enjoy the pride of ownership. It must be something for the guy who owns that Costco or any Costco 
to just, you know, drive into the parking lot and look around and see beautiful building and see the parking lot full and watch the carts going in and coming out full. I mean, there, there must be real pride and ownership. This is a good store. It's doing well. It's successful. They're, they must enjoy the rewards of success. I mean, gee, what is that profit on a million dollars? I don't know, but there's got to be pretty good profit there. And they, they enjoy the rewards. But I mean, he must really love it seeing those carts full and overflowing because that means money's coming into my pocket and, and there must be the satisfaction of ownership. Must be something to be, must feel good, you know, to think people will actually pay to shop in my store. You know, they'll pay to come in store and then spend money. Unbelievable. Must be satisfying to know I've got a good business, a successful business, and, and people like it, and people come, and people get a good deal. It must be a real sense of, uh, of satisfaction in that ownership. But you want to know something? The consumers of Costco don't share in any of those things. I mean, I get no sense of pride in seeing the parking lot at Costco filled. In fact, I hate it because it means I'm going to have a hard time finding a spot and we'll be away at the back somewhere. And there's, no, there's no sense of pride in that for me. And, and, and I don't enjoy the rewards of success. You know, when, I, when I see those carts coming out full, I don't go think, oh, that's wonderful. Look at all those carts that are full. I'm thinking... Where's all the money coming from? I mean, how can those people afford all that stuff? You, know, you see it going out. There's no sense of satisfaction or reward. And, and definitely the rewards. I don't enjoy the rewards. I have shopped at that Costco since it opened. I don't know when it opened. 2005. Captain in 2005, I became one of the original members there. And I've been there ever since, for what, 13 years. So I've been shopping there 13 or 14 years. You know what? Not one January did I get ever get a letter with a check in it from Costco saying, here's your share of the profits for the last year. I don't get any of the share of the profits. I get my little bit of feedback on what I buy and so forth. But I don't get a part of the profits because I'm a consumer. I'm not an owner. The advantages of owning so outweigh the disadvantages, so outweigh the downside. It's not even close. Which drives me to ask the question, Why? If ownership is so much better than being a consumer, why do the average churchgoer across Canada and the United States today, why does the average churchgoer choose to be a consumer of spiritual things rather than an owner? Why? And, and is this true? Do they choose to be a consumer? Yeah, it is true if you look at the surveys. Because, you know, most churchgoers, they, they kind of use their faith. Their faith isn't all that important to them. They're not passionate about it. They're glad that they have it. It's, it's kind of more of a fire insurance. I don't want to go to hell, so I, you know, I believe in Jesus. I go to church a little bit because, you know, it's a good thing to do, but it doesn't make all that much difference in my life. If I miss Sundays, okay, it doesn't matter. If I don't read my Bible, it doesn't matter because, you know, it's a part. They use it. And, and a lot of churchgoers use the church. You know, they're not heavily invested in it. They're not really working to make it grow or get better. They're you know, they kind of come and enjoy the, the benefits of it, and then they kind of leave. In fact, when you stop to think of it, a lot of churchgoers across Canada today treat their church like a spiritual Costco. You know, really, they, they pay their membership, and, you know, the membership at uh, the average church across Canada today is a better deal than Costco. Let me tell you, Costco tells you membership costs this, this, or this. You can pick your level, but it's going to cost you. The church says... You can choose what you want to pay. I mean, membership in a church is you can pay nothing up to thousands of dollars. It's your choice. We, we don't give out membership cards. We don't have the ushers checking your card when you came in this morning, did you? They, they welcomed you. They shook your hand. They gave you a program, but they weren't checking to make sure you got a card. And when you leave, the ushers aren't checking off to make sure you haven't taken anything out of the church that you shouldn't have taken out of the church either, Right. And membership is so much easier in the church. It's cheaper in the church. And so we give what we want, and then, then we take advantage of all the opportunities that are in the church, and, and, and we leave. The average churchgoer doesn't take any more ownership of their church building or their church parking lot or the ministries of the church than the average Costco member takes of their building and their parking lot and their sales. I mean, how many Costco members do you see picking up garbage in the Costco parking lot as they make their way into the building? How many do you see them picking up garbage around the building inside? How many do you, kind of members do you see where, you know, people have picked up something they're going to buy and then decide they don't want it and they just stick it on the shelf anywhere they, they can find it there? And so how many members do you see picking that up and taking it back to the right place? People don't do that. And, and where do Costco members leave their buggy when they're finished shopping? Now, you know this too. Now, some of them put them in where they're supposed to go. 
But a lot of them leave them where it's convenient, between cars, in front of cars, get their wheels hooked up over a curb somewhere so they won't roll away, but they want to walk the extra 20 feet to put them where they're supposed to go. Why? Because they're a consumer. They're not an owner. That, that Costco's there to serve them, not them Costco, so they're not going to do any of those things. And isn't that the way the average church goer approaches church? You know, it's, I don't own the church. I don't own the building, you know, and so I kind of come and I use it. And, and, and then I leave. We choose to be consumers rather than owners. But why would we do that? Well, why would the average church goer choose to be a consumer when God has offered them the opportunity of something so much better, the opportunity to be an owner? It's a really good question. I've thought about it, and I, I think I've got the answer. It may not be the answer. You may have a better answer, but here's my answer why it is. It's because it's just easy. It's easier to be a consumer than it is to be an owner. I mean, it's easy. You just kind of come, and you go. You don't have to get involved. You don't have to pay anything. You know, you just come and, and use. And, and what other people, it's just so much easier to do that. You don't have any of the responsibilities of ownership. It's just much easier to come and to go. A couple of weeks ago, I, I got to experience this firsthand. A few, few weeks ago, I, I attended an event here at the church that I had no ownership in and no responsibility in. It was actually a surprise birthday party. And, and so we showed up at the church, Judy and I showed up at the church just a few minutes before it began without a care in the world, without a thought in the world. I, I mean, we didn't think, I didn't think when we drove up, I wonder if the doors are unlocked. Are the lights on? Has the room been set up? Are the tables in the right place? The food in there? Never thought of anything of those things, just drove up, opened the door, and there was somebody right there to greet me. He showed me where to hang my coat. I already knew, but he showed me where to hang, hang my coat. And then he took me down to the theater where the party was, and I walked into the room, and it was beautiful. It had been all decorated. At one end, there was all the food laid out, and there were some of the guests already there, and I hadn't done a thing. I never asked anybody to set up tables. I never set up tables. I never checked on the food. No, I just showed up. And all night, it was so easy. I had no cares in the world. I wasn't, you know, checking on the food every so often. Is it running out? You know, is the food, uh, have we got enough to drink? Do we need to refill that? I, I wasn't looking around thinking, is everybody getting involved here? Has everybody got food? Is everybody being cared for? Anybody off by themselves? I never did any of those things. And I never thought about the program. Didn't know if there was a program. Didn't know who was going to speak, if anybody was going to speak. Didn't know if the slides were going to be ready or not. None of those things. I just sat there and enjoyed it and talked to people and ate the food. And this was the best part. This was the most shocking part of all for me. When it, was, when it was over and we decided it was time to go home, Judy and I just said goodbye, put our coats on, and walked out the door. Got in our car and drove away. I mean, the lights were still on. People were still here. The food was still out. The doors were unlocked. And we just drove away. I'm telling you, it was so easy. A very relaxing night. Now, mind you, I didn't have any of the sense of satisfaction in pulling off a surprise party in this day of, you know, cell phones and everything. And I, I didn't have the sense of, you know, uh, achievement or, or just plain satisfaction in, in, in seeing my spouse happy that a party had been planned for them without them even knowing. I didn't have any of that, but I didn't have any of the responsibility either. I just came in and I laughed. And that's exactly why the average churchgoer in North America today stays as a consumer rather than an owner because it allows them just to come in and go without any of the responsibility and just enjoy everything that has been provided for them. It's easy to be a, cost, a, a consumer. But what so many people don't understand who are consumers is that being a consumer is easy. It is so much less rewarding than being an owner. You see, there's no sense of satisfaction when you're a consumer. You're just taking in what somebody else has provided. There, there, there's no sense of accomplishment. In fact, if you are a consumer long enough, you get to the point where you just want more and you want more and you want more. What, what do they tell you about the people who are really rich? They want more money. Why do they want more? I don't know. They just want more. When you're in consuming, it's just more and more and more and more. And in fact, if we are in con being a consumer long enough, we get to the point where we say this, is that all there is? Because you see, being a consumer isn't satisfying. It doesn't, you want the next thing and the next thing and the next thing because things don't satisfy. In fact, you know the reason why the average churchgoer in North America today doesn't find Jesus Christ satisfying. He's not a big part of their life. The, the church isn't a huge part of their life. 
The, the reason why people who used to attend church and left because they say it's irrelevant and it really didn't make any difference in my life. The, the reason why people who have never chosen to believe in Jesus look, look at Jesus and look at the church and they say, I don't need that. It's irrelevant. I've seen people that go there and believe that and it doesn't make any difference in their life. I don't need any of that. The reason the people in each of these groups are the way they are is because somewhere along the line, they have been a consumer of spiritual things. They kind of just tried it out. They've consumed it a little bit, and they found it unsatisfying, unrewarding. It didn't make the difference they were looking for. And you know what? It never will. Never will. Because, and this is something we need to remember, there is little to no satisfaction in being just a consumer of spiritual things. If all we do is consume it, there's little to no satisfaction. See, the only way we experience real satisfaction in our relationship with Jesus Christ, the, the only way we really find that, that Christ makes a difference and our Christian faith is really important and significant in our life and our church is so important to us, the only time that happens is when we pick up the key that Jesus gave us and take ownership of Jesus, make him our own savior in our own church. But unfortunately, only about 20% of the people in churches across North America today have taken that step. 80% choose just to be a consumer. Which have you chosen? Which are, which are you? Now, I don't know. You're the only one that knows the answer to that question. Have you chosen to be a consumer or have you chosen to be an owner? I want to tell you this morning, Jesus, Jesus didn't come on that first Christmas to pass out membership cards to a spiritual Costco. He, he, he didn't come that first Christmas so that we could consume some spiritual things that are good and, and, and wonderful. Jesus Christ came on that first Christmas to adopt you into his own family. He came to make you a partner with him a full partner, not a junior partner, a full partner with him. He came to give you full ownership of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, full ownership in the message and the kingdom of God, full ownership of heaven and full ownership of his church. And that's why today I am re-gifting this key to you. Because Jesus wants you to own it. And I want you to own it. Because if you only come to church because it's the good thing to do. If you only come to church out of habit, if you only come to church because that's the way you were raised, if you only come to church because, you know, you're kind of hanging on to your parents or your grandparents' faith, I'm going to tell you, Jesus will never be to you what you need him to be and what he wants to be. And your faith will never be that life-transforming power in your life. The church will never seem like yours. It'll always just seem like the church. You've got to come to the point where you take the key and you take ownership. Where you come to that point in your life where you no longer say Jesus is the Savior of the world. You say Jesus is my Savior. He's not just the Lord of Lords. He's my Lord. He's not just the Redeemer of people. He's my Redeemer. He's not just the forgiver of sins. He's my forgiver of sins. And you say the faith, the Christian faith, is no longer just the Christian faith. It's not a religion. This is my faith. And this church that I attend is not just the bridge. It's not just the church I go to. It's my church because it belongs to Jesus. And I am partners with Jesus in everything that he has. So I'm offering you the ownership again so that you might really experience what it means to know Jesus and make your faith real in your life. And the way you do that is, first of all, by praying and repenting of your sin and inviting Jesus Christ into your Lord and Savior. And then once you've done that, you make the decision that, you know, I'm no longer going to have Christianity be something I do, but rather it's going to be something I am. I I'm no longer just going to consume spiritual things. I I'm going to get fully invested in the things of the Lord, my time, my talent, and my money. And I'm going to tell you, when you make that choice, when you step across that line, when you say no more being a consumer, I'm going to accept Jesus' offer to take this key and be an owner of all things spiritual. I'm telling you, God is going to meet you and he's going to transform your life and your relationship with Jesus Christ is going to change. It's going to radically change and you're going to become a partner with him and you're going to experience Jesus in a way you never experienced him before. And so as we close this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to pick up this key and take it 
and accept ownership of all the things of the Lord. I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody to pray it. I've written this prayer here for you. It goes like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for offering me the keys of ownership of you in my faith. I am tired of being a consumer. I want to make you and my faith my very own. So please forgive me of my sin. and Come into my life as my Savior. I covenant to get fully invested time, talent, and money in you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I know some of the grammar there isn't great, but I was not trying to convey grammar. I was trying to convey the thought of our hearts to give it to the Lord. So I'm going to ask you all to stand right now, and I'm going to invite all of you to pray this out loud with me. Just read it with me. But as you're reading it, if this is your prayer, if you're saying to Jesus, this is my prayer this morning, God is going to place in your hand the key of ownership to himself, to his kingdom, partnership. Your name goes on the wall next to Jesus. You're going to own all things spiritual. You're going to take on a whole new relationship with Jesus Christ. So would you read this out loud together with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for offering me the keys of ownership of you and my faith. I'm tired of being a consumer. I want to make you and my faith my very own. So please forgive me of my sin and come into my life as my Savior. I covenant to get fully invested, time, talent, money, in you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Boy, it's such a simple prayer. It's easy to read. But if that came from your heart this morning, well, there's a celebration in heaven. Because the reason God sent Jesus in the first place was to give you ownership of all things spiritual. That you might be adopted into his family. You might be a partner with Jesus Christ. And if that prayer came from your heart, those things became true of you. And now we all must just get fully invested in him, in the things of our Lord, the time, our talent, and our money.